to ask how you got started in boxing. So I remember Dr. Nissin Sethi telling me ages ago that it was almost a taboo subject for neurologists to get involved with boxing. I lived in Los Angeles and when I was done uh, with my my education, I started practicing in Las Vegas. And at that time, that's back in the, oh God, late 80s, you know, boxing was at its height in Las Vegas. Um, there were all those wonderful <clears throat> outdoor fights at Caesars and, you know, just, it was just a great, great time for the sport. And um, I always wanted to somehow be involved, but I didn't really know how. And um, then there was one evening, <clears throat> excuse me, I just got off my horse, so forgive me, it was a lot of dust out here. Um, one evening, I was sitting at home and there was this fight that was going to be on HBO. Um, and I think it was Simon Brown and maybe Terry Norris at that time. And the fight got canceled right before the fight was supposed to start. And it, I don't think it was at the Caesars. It was supposed to be, I think, at the Mirage. And um, sure enough, I'm sitting at home and my phone rang. And it was to do a consult on Simon Brown in the emergency room. And I was on call that weekend. So I was like, oh my God, I get to go examine a professional fighter. And so after that, I contacted uh, Dr. Homansky, who's obviously been my partner for many, many years now. But at that time, we didn't really know each other. And I said, how do I get involved? And um, he said, well, you've never done this before. Um, you need to go train in the amateurs. So I started as an amateur physician and did that for about a year and a half and then just waited until a spot opened up on the commission. You know, you had to kind of prove yourself. Um, at that time, there were no women that were physicians, ring physicians with the commission. I think now they only still have one here. I don't know how it is elsewhere, but um, very limited. And so I just kind of worked my way up. The other reason why I wanted to do it was I really loved professional wrestling. You know, WWE was WWF still at that time. And so I loved wrestling. So it, they liked having me there because I was always willing to work all the wrestling matches. Yeah, and it was, long, it was fun. For the longest time, the commissions were boxing and wrestling commissions, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they kind of oversee. Now, the, the WWE used to bring their own physicians with them just in case because they were all on God knows what kind of drugs. But we still, it was through the state was collecting tax money on professional wrestling. So oh. we had to cover it. We yeah. didn't have officials working the matches, obviously, but there were, you know, physicians. And we had some really great matches at a very small kind of downtown kind of raunchy casino with wasn't wwe but it was actually older wrestlers that were trying to make a living still and those were wild i mean they were wild we had midget wrestling we had all kinds of stuff it should say little person because it's incorrect to say midget but that's what they called it at that yeah, time i remember yeah and uh it was it was insane i mean people were drunk and throwing things and i got stuff thrown on me and but it was fun it was fun back then who were some of the wrestlers that you liked back in the day? Um, back then we had, um, I'll never forget this great night, and, and Flip would tell you about this too, with the Iron Sheik. And um, we were waiting for his opponent to show up. This was at a place called the Silver Nugget, and I don't even know if it's still there anymore. And the crowd was getting drunker and drunker because nothing was happening. And finally, the Iron Sheik said, I'm going to fix this. And he gets in the middle of the, the ring. And he had some kind of weird, I don't know, it was like an anvil. And he challenged someone in the audience to come up and, and, and challenge him with this anvil. And he would spin it around and spin it around. So it was some drunk idiot gets up there thinking he's going to take down the Iron Sheik. Okay. This is before MMA was even thought of as being licensed in, in the U.S. This guy jumps on the Iron Sheik. The Iron Sheik takes his, throws down the thing he was swinging, takes his shoe. And if you know the Sheik, he had these Sheik shoes that were like pointy. Yeah, sure. At the end, you know, kind of curved up. Yeah. Okay, he takes his shoe, kicks the guy right through the mouth, lacerated 
his whole face, his nose. And I'm sitting there and I'm sitting with Flip and I'm, and we kind of had to have an ambulance there. And I'm going, Oh, this is just part of the show. You know how they always had, I said, they were just trying to, you know, buy time. This couldn't be real. Flip goes, no, get up there. There was blood everywhere. They had to transport this guy. Anyway, finally the show went on, but it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Just with his foot, he just cut the guy because he said, this guy's not going to come near me. You know, he's professional. And anyway, it was amazing. It was amazing. Oh, wow. And going back to the boxing, had you been a fan of that as a kid or growing up? Because you grew up in yeah. Toronto, didn't you? Pardon? You grew up in Toronto. No, I actually moved. Uh, my dad was in the music business and we moved to California when I was six. So I was kind of around the entertainment business. But my dad always loved fights and we used to watch those all the time together. So, I mean, I was a total fan. It was wonderful. And so th so that kind of is self-explanatory with that. But then how, how get into, why get into neurology and go down that path? Because the, like I said at the start, they're two extremely, they're two different extremes. No, I never really thought of it that way. I know what Sethi saw it. I, I didn't, I didn't appreciate it. To me, I felt that I, I didn't think there should be any inhibition to the sport, but I was just glad. I, I thought that probably neurologists were one of the best people to have ringside. And it certainly was an education for me in my field, because usually if we would see somebody with a concussion or a head injury, um, it would be sometimes hours or days after it happened. But here you were there while it was happening. So it was a very big education for me. I learned a lot. I had a great, I had even greater respect for what we did. I think that, you know, this is kind of off topic, but I think that in a way, um, emergency room physicians are probably almost the best to have because especially with MMA and all the different injuries that fighters have, but I think it's great to have a neurologist there anyway. Yeah, of course, because um, like you say, we are digressing a little bit, but some people don't know that when, if you have a ringside physician, it can be someone in orthopedics or anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Ophthalmology or who knows what. Yeah. Which doesn't have that necessarily the direct correlation, certainly to head injuries. I think in the UK, don't you, a lot of the time you have an anesthesiologist. Yes. Somebody or anesthetist. Yeah, which is probably a good thing too. We always have paramedics that are able to intubate and provide any assistance, pulmonary assistance immediately like that. If there's you know, some God forbid disaster. Um, how long did you spend um, learning your craft in the amateurs? Um, it was about a year and a half. And I mean, it could have been a lot longer, but it would just depended on when, you know, the athletic commissions, I don't know how it is in other states, but in the state of Nevada, it's a very closed system and they want to make sure that somebody is very well trained. So during that time of that year and a half, I went to as many professional fights as I could and hung out with the doctors um, learned what they did and, and, you know, just became accustomed to it because it's, it's, it's a specialty in of itself. Yeah, of course. And then what happened? So a position opened up on the Nevada State Athletic Commission and, and yeah. you came. Mm -hmm. I it was, I oh got, I was so excited, but even then, um, you know, when you start off, um, I, like I said, I don't know how it is in other States, but because there were a lot of really well-trained physicians, when I came on, um, you really had to kind of learn the craft by sitting ringside, working with the fighters in the back. So for the first several years, um, all I did was work in the back. And that meant um, going back with the fighters post-fight, examining them, helping to determine triaging them, depending on what kind of care they required. So I did that for an, a longer period of time. And I mean, I enjoyed that tremendously because you got to see I know you you've done all these wonderful podcasts and talked to all these fighters but um, you learned a lot about being with a fighter before they go out in the ring um, and then after how they respond how their their corner responds the people with them whether they win or lose it was it was an incredible experience right back then at the start before you became so well, so well respected was there any pushback because you were a woman from anyone, anywhere? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, really ridiculous stories. I mean, there was one, there was, I'll tell you a good and a bad. One instance was, I remember Bob Arum getting up 
on national television lambasting me. I don't even remember what I, I don't think I even did anything. I think, I think, oh, I remember. Yes, this was, um, this was a fight with a fighter who's a wonderful, wonderful young man, Johnny, um, uh, Danny Romero. And um, it was one of my first experiences where I was really working ringside and it was an ESPN fight and Danny Romero was kind of a um, preliminary fight for him to go on and fight a pay-per-view fight against Johnny Tapia. So he was fighting a lesser known fighter um, on ESPN. They thought Danny was going to walk through the guy and lo and behold, I think, I don't remember what round it was, but it was right at the beginning. Danny um, suffered an orbital fracture, fractured the bones in his eye. And his eye started to swell and, you know, there was going his chances of fighting Johnny Tapia next. But, but at any rate, oh my God, I think everyone got on television and just said, this is why you don't have women here because I ended up stopping the fight, recommending that it stop in Nevada. The doctors don't stop the fight. They recommend to the referee. So I told the referee, you know, you need to stop it. And they were like, oh my God, she can't stand the sight of blood. She can't stand facial swelling. And sure enough, no one understood that he had this horrible fracture. He ended up having surgery. He might've had multiple surgeries to repair it. But um, so that was a bad experience. A different fun experience was, you know, everyone was worried about me working post fight because we had to collect the urine. Back then, the doctors were the ones that collect the urine, not the inspectors. And it may be that way still in many commissions. And so, you know, back then, most of the fights uh, were men. There wasn't that many women fights, women bouts. And so I remember it was funny, someone was talking about one of the cards that recently took place at the Mohegan Sun, that it was just a great card. Back then, Don King used to have amazing fight cards. He used to have maybe like five championship fights on a card. And there was one card that he had down in Prim, Nevada, which is kind of outside of Las Vegas by about, I don't know, 20 miles, 30 miles. And there were all these championship fights and, and they weren't used to having fights. So all the fighters were in one big room. There was no real dressing rooms. And I went back after one of the championship fights with my little urine cup, because I was working in the back, to go collect the, the urine. And all the fighters, the, it, it was the, um, everyone spoke Spanish. No one spoke English. So I said in Spanish that I need to collect the urine. And all the fighters at once dropped their pants because they didn't understand my Spanish. So it wasn't just one guy. And I remember going back out to ringside and I said, you guys thought I was going to have a problem. I said, they all dropped their pants. So obviously it's not such a big deal. So anyway, after that, I kind of felt like I was okay and, and I could do anything that they needed me to do. Yeah, I was going to say there was, um, it doesn't strike me that you would have had much pushback from the fighters because fighters are generally... Um, mm -hmm. more open and more accommodating and, and I don't think they would have seen any kind of novelty value or, or anything no. like that. No, no, it was, it was, it was just the commission had a concern just because they didn't know. Um, and, and it was just something that was new. I mean, it's just like anything. And, and uh, no, the fighters were always wonderful. Matter of fact, I, I mean, I, maybe people think it's not right for me to say it, but I really do think they would talk to me more. They would tell me more how they were feeling, if they were hurting or concerns they had, um, especially at a weigh-in, you know, when we didn't have much time to examine them. I felt I had an advantage in that respect. So. Well, different to some of the neurologists I've spoken to over the years, you, you actually know about the sport and are passionate about the sport. Some of the neurologists are passionate about neurology and what they do, but they don't understand the sport. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But that's why I said it was such an advantage to be ringside and, and, you know, you don't want to see anybody get hurt, but it, I mean, it was just phenomenal from a, from a medical perspective um, to be able to differentiate when someone was hurt, someone wasn't hurt, what their neurological exam looked like at that time. Um, you know, like I said, you never were fortunate enough to see that unfortunate circumstance where that was evolving. And it was, it was a challenge, but it was fascinating. So when you joined the commission, you didn't have like a cavalier um, attitude to be, to be an A, like a pioneer or B, implementing dramatic change as such. It was just to go and have, have a, you know, enjoy the job. 
Yeah, and it was pressure. I always remember the first thing that Flip said to me, Dr. Homansky said, you know, are you going to be able to stand the pressure? And I was like, what, what pressure? It was a lot of pressure. It was pressure on everyone, anyone that's an official, whether they be a judge or a referee, a commissioner or a ring physician. Um, you bear a huge responsibility. It's not just that you have to worry which is these first and foremost, but you have a lot of other people there that you have to be able to convey what you're doing or why you're not doing something. And so it, it is very much of an art um, to do it the right way. I, I, like I said, I don't really watch much fights anymore, mainly just burned out on doing that. You know, I, I mean, I love the fighters and it's such an honor to be able to work with them through VADA, but um, I don't watch a lot of matches. Um, man, it, it almost looks too violent to me at times, you know, and I wonder sometimes how I was able to sit there, but, but, um, it's an, it's an, a t just an amazing learning process for everyone, but you've got, you know, especially in Nevada where most of the fights were televised, you have, you know, the commentators, you've got the commission, you've got the corners and everyone has to know that you know what you're doing and you've got the crowd and you want to say that none of that's important and of course it isn't when you're dealing with potentially life and death situations but you have to be able to explain what you're doing and why that's so important and that was something that i was taught very well by by dr homansky but not all ring physicians are taught that um, and it's the same thing for a referee, especially. Um, it's important that everyone understands because everyone has a, a, a stake in it. Everyone is watching while you're doing it. And so your actions become very important, what you do and what you don't do. So it's something that's a consideration. Yeah, I mean, in a roundabout way, I think one of the things you're trying to say is it can get very political out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're very political. And I don't mean just Vegas, but I mean, that's, that's boxing. And obviously, it's one of those things where if... Uh, doctor has to stop a fight then you know the doctor might have in the back of the mind well the fans haven't had value for money so the promoter will get upset or like you said one of the corners will get upset and they'll, they'll think that you're favoring the other and all the rest of it so when you make these calls about someone's health and safety it's not as black and white as perhaps not, not, not necessarily saying it should be or could be but it's hard to ignore the gray area in between where you've got other people's thoughts, feelings, and emotions to take into consideration with your decision. Well, and also you have to be able to explain what you're doing. And sometimes in the one minute time between rounds or when you go in to make a recommendation, um, you don't have enough time. So you have to really truly demonstrate as best you can why you're making that decision and that's done in a lot of ways I mean you're getting kind of into the intricacies of what a ring physician does and doesn't do that maybe the fans or people that watch a fight don't understand but there can be a whole evolution process you know I used to look at a fight as kind of like an opera in the sense that there were three acts to it. And so, you know, you've got the fighters coming out that are in perfect shape and condition, you know, you're watching that. And then there's these intermissions in between. And during that, there may be an evolution of how the fighter, both fighters are handling the punishment. And so it's important for you to observe that, that transition as the fight evolves or doesn't involve, depending on if there's a quick knockout or quick TKO, but you have to be involved with the referee. And one of the things that I learned very well and was taught was to interact very well with the referee, that the referee and the physician have signals between them to understand what the referee is seeing, because I'm not going to see as well as the referee who's right there in the middle and convey that. And often if a doctor was thinking about there's never that in other words there's never that one minute where a fight needs to stop that's pretty unusual unless somebody is really getting quite hurt and the referee steps in often what it is it's kind of an evolution process 
during the fight. And so the referee and the doctor have to communicate what they're both seeing. If you're starting to see that maybe that fighter is taking too much, it's important for the doctor to go in and maybe check that fighter between rounds, see how they're doing, and, and have a discussion with the referee that no one really is that aware of so that when the fight is stopped, everyone is more comfortable with it, including the fighter, including, you know, especially, uh, obviously, if someone's hurt, they're hurt, and that that's not debatable. But often, that's not the case. And so there's that, learn, that process that goes on during the fight. And so it's important for that doctor to sell their call, whatever it is, whether it's from a cut, uh, very few fights stop on a cut, but, but you can often use that cut but to say when that fighter's had enough, especially if that fighter's taking additional punishment that could be affecting their neurological function or cognitive function. There's, it's, and what I'm trying to say is there's often not that one, one second where you make that decision. You know, it's often, the crowd will often know more than what the officials are saying because they're on the outside, they're an impartial viewer. I'll often say, see that when I used to watch fights, especially when I wasn't working, I would see that the crowd would often go, why isn't somebody stepping in and stopping that fight? And you were wondering why the officials weren't doing it. But they're outside and can be impartial and see actually what's going on. So you don't want to lose, lose that perspective. So it really is a tough job. Um, what were some of the bigger fights that you handled while you were on the commission? Um, well, working ringside, um, I did uh, several of the De La Hoya fights. Um, I remember working um, Lennox Lewis. I worked uh, one of the Mike Tyson, two of the Mike Tyson fights. Some of the Mike Tyson fights that we had in Las Vegas, um, I worked in the back. Um, gosh, I, I mean, Fernando Vargas, um, Eric Morales, Barrera. I mean, just all during that period of time. Uh, from about uh, 1994 to 2005 was when I was really working ringside. And of course, during some of that time, I was on the medical advisory board um, helping to advise on uh, medical issues. Um, in 2000, I think it was, you wrote Ringside and Training Principles. Yeah, we did that um, with uh, several in the sport, and it was, I always hoped that we would do another one much more current, um, but we got some of the really big people in the sport, um, some of the fighters and trainers to write information for the fighters. You know, this was kind of before so much was on the internet back then, and so Basically, it was supposed to be kind of a handbook in Spanish and English for fighters to look at from, because a lot of fighters, especially when they're coming up, don't have access to the best training, uh, the best conditioning people in the world, didn't understand the medical aspects. And so we kind of covered all of that. And it was great to have all the people um, like Ray Leonard and Teddy Atlas. Um, some of these people just contribute on their thoughts and what they appreciated. Manuel Stewart, you know, it was great. Yeah, it is a really good book, and I recommend anyone to try and pick it up because it is, um, it's kind of like a crash course. You know, you, you know, they do that, um, they do series of like um, easy to explain books for people and stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's one of those that fighters and trainers shouldn't be without because it covers so many elements of the sport. Mm, well, thanks. Yeah, it was great. We were really happy that the commission supported it. Um, um, interestingly enough, this was before MMA got licensed in Nevada, but the uh, Fertitas uh, through Station Casinos were very supportive of it. I think, I can't remember if uh, Lorenzo Fertitta was on the commission at that time, but they helped support funding for the book as well. It was great. And then uh, you wrote Death in Vegas, which is a novel, <laughs> cl clearly a more personal book though. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, well, it was funny because I still... I mean, we've talked about this, you and I, is that um, most of the, the, the things that come out, books and films and all this on, on the sport of boxing are about the fighters themselves. And obviously it is about the fighters, but there's this whole other thing that goes on, you know, like you said, the political aspects, the aspects of the commission, the aspects of the promoters, the medical aspects. And so... When I left working as a ringside physician, I thought it would be a great cathartic thing for me because I was so frustrated. And 
we talked about in that book about concussion. We talked about a little bit how fights get made. We talked about the officiating, judging, refereeing, um, sanctioning bodies. So it was everything that I was fortunate, unlike a lot of ring physicians, I was very fortunate to uh, see and learn from. I thought it would be fun for the average person. The other reason why I did it was still back then, there were not as many women that were enjoying boxing. And I, I mean, it's just such an amazing sport. I mean, there's no greater um, reality show taking place than a boxing match. And so I thought it would be a great way. And I tried to cater it a lot to get another audience to kind of love the sport as I do. Sure. And um, Thomas Hauser helped out a little bit, didn't he? Yeah, uh, he is great. Yeah, uh, he's, I mean, he's an amazing author. Just amazing. I learn from him all the time. There's a couple of differences, obviously, between the books. And you can tell that um, Ring Fight and Predator Training Principles is when you're there almost trying to spearhead change and trying to say, look, this is what you guys need to do. But by the time you do Death in Vegas, it's <laughs> like, well, this is actually what goes on. I know, more pissed off than what goes on. But, you know, it, it was funny when I left the commission, and obviously it's a different commission now, but when I left, I wanted so many changes. And, and that was one reason why I left, because at that time, um, I was basically very, very disillusioned and unhappy with some of the protocols that were in place and some of the... I just felt that there should be more um, openness when things don't go well, okay? Um, you know, maybe you can compare it to poli politics these days, but, but I felt because lives were at stake um, that it was important to maybe have hearings and open discussions on things that needed to change. And at that time, um, it was conveyed that if I wanted things to change, I couldn't do it from within. I needed to keep my mouth shut, so to speak, um, that they would get to those things, but not right away. You know, something bad happens. I wanted things fixed now. Since we knew how to fix them, I wanted it fixed right then and there. And it was basically, you know, pat on the head. Um, we'll get it done, but we'll get it done in our own time. And I was like, I can't, I can't stay here if that's the case. And so they said, well, then leave. Well, the attitude's kind of, let's wait until something goes wrong, then we'll react. No, things had gone wrong, but they, but it was basically, it would look bad or it would be politically bad to make those changes right then and there, because then it would prove that we were wrong. Do you know what I mean? It was better to kind of put those things in. And, you know, soon after that, they did make those changes. Um, do I feel like I helped bring that back sooner? I don't know. I was, I was so frustrated and upset and went so public that those changes needed to be made. I mean, obviously made a ton of enemies, but I felt that it was for the benefit of the fighters. So I've kind of felt a little bit like a whistleblower. And it wasn't just for Nevada, it was for the, the sport itself. And, you know, it's like we will probably get into just a little bit. I don't want to take too much of your time on this, but, but that's another reason why I went and started working, you know, helping to form VADA because that was just one other area that wasn't being addressed. But, but back as a ring physician and head of the medical advisory board, I was just frustrated that there could be very simple changes to improve the health and safety for the fighters and for the officials to make the fights more fair, to make, um, just improve things overall. But it was kind of like, well, we'll get to it. I wanted it done right then and there. Maybe that's part, you know, that's maybe not a good thing that sometimes it's good to step back and make those changes as time goes on. But to me, if the changes could have been made right away, they should be made right away. You know, no matter how the responsibility falls on what yeah. went wrong sure i mean because um you would have been um aware of in your role on the commission and obviously now subsequently um with, with stuff that goes on in boxing of how disorganized it is but also how that it does create a dangerous environment uh, in the mm -hmm. sense that obviously and it's up to you it'd be great if you could give me some examples or with or without naming names, but fighters you might have seen fail medical somewhere and then get licenses elsewhere. And that must be one of the most infuriating things for a neurologist to see because you know 
that you're not only at risk of these guys suffering, suffering acute injuries, but chronic injuries down the line. And that speaks to a, a lot of issues. Um, it speaks to the regulatory issues of the sport that still are not good. They're not adequate, let's put it that way. Um, sharing of information, um, sharing of, of adverse drug test results. I mean, you just don't get that sharing of everything. I mean, I think that the Association of Boxing Commissions just doesn't unfortunately still have the teeth to kind of enforce what the changes need to be so that, yes, you're right, there are fighters that, um, and, and, you know, look, it may end up, it's not so much the fighters, it's the promotional entities, they'll, they'll commission shop. You know, they'll go to a different commission when it's, they know it's easier to get their fighter licensed if that, that fighter may But I think as a whole, it's very difficult, still is difficult. And you and I have talked about this when you were writing your book, um, that it's very difficult to deny a fighter a license. And, and unfortunately, it often happens too late. But um, that's probably, to me, should be one of the most important roles of a commission is to determine uh, licensure and not just rubber stamp it. Um, and it becomes very difficult to make the determination when someone should no longer have that license because a license to box is a privilege and it's not a right. And it's like a driver's license. You have to prove your efficiency to have one. Same thing with a boxing license. And a lot of commissions don't have the funds, the personnel to make those determinations. And then other commissions, politically, it can be a difficult thing. And the medical tests themselves may not be adequate to help make that determination. And then lastly, sometimes the medical tests themselves don't don't demonstrate when it's time when everyone else knows it's time there's nothing that you can fall back on and unfortunately you know we do live in a system where everyone has a legal right to fight something um, it's very hard to uphold that and it's hard to make those determinations um, and I, I think that was another thing that we used to do is and we used to I used to Dr. Homansky and I used to give this talk is how to deny a fighter a license or become the most hated person in the sport because that's what you end up doing. Um, but but you try to do the right thing. You know, you have to always try that or what's the point? Yeah, because some of these fighters who pass physical tests when they're near the end of the line, physically, they might look okay and physically fit they might be able to jump rope and hit the bag and 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 spar and even fight to a, to a degree and shadow box and do that kind of stuff but you can tell they aren't necessarily speaking the same way as they were 10 15 years earlier and they're not as sharp as they were 10 or 15 years earlier but physically they can pass the tests exactly especially if they're examined by somebody different each time if you don't have that comparison and I remember I would deal with that, not on a frequent basis, but occasionally where, you know, the fighter, um, we said that fighter needed testing before they would get another license or get taken off suspension. And the doctor they saw had never seen them before and they go, well, they look okay to me, but I knew from watching them over time and their fights, the deterioration. And so it frustrated me to no end. I appreciate you humoring me on this because I know that the centralized stuff irks you as much as it irks me. Um, but while I've got you on that, there were just a couple of things I wanted to ask you. And that was, um, I mean, you, you sort of touched upon it about how disillusioned you are or have been by it. And, and, and I have, you know, we spent a great deal of time talking about it in Vegas, well, I suppose it's a couple of years ago now. Was there a time where you nearly walked away from it altogether because you just fed up with it? Yeah. No, I did. I walked away um, in 2007. I think it was 2007 when my term was up uh, with the Medical Advisory Board. I just said, this is it. You know, I, I did continue to write for the ring for the ring for a while. Um, but yeah, I walked away from it and, 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 I think we've spoke about this before too, is that um, I had a good friend, he's now retired, living in Florida, but he was the attorney, um, the deputy attorney general for the Maryland Boxing Commission and also the Racing Commission. 
and I did both. So I was so frustrated. There was a, a beautiful Kentucky Derby winner racehorse, Barbaro, that a lot of people loved that got hurt. And I was just fascinated with this horse. I love animals. And it was just, oh, God, I was hoping this horse would make it. You know, he was being hospitalized. They were showing him in the hospital. And um, this was back in that part of the country. And so I contacted my friend and I said, can I come back and visit with you? And I went back there and spoke to um, some of his phys the horse's physicians, my friend who um, took me to the racetrack. Um, you know, I got to see how Pimlico was. Um, I got to learn a lot. I even went to Kentucky and learned about how the racehorses were rehabbed and treated. And what I found was um, I came upon the fact that I was astounded that even back then, it's not nearly as good and hope passed the bill to enhance drug testing and in, in, in racehorsing. But back then, the racehorses were all were getting much more uh, drug tested than the humans in boxing and in MMA. And so that's kind of how I, I came upon that that idea that there was there needed to be a lot more in protecting the fighters as far as performance enhancing drugs but but yeah no i walked away for a period of a few years and it wasn't even until 2011 that we we started vada um but yeah that fascinated me that i thought that the the racehorse business was getting a lot better care than the human combat sports business um, just one last thing on that centralized thing. How close were we getting? To, how close were we to getting federal oversight with Senator John McCain? Was it was it close? Do you think? No, I don't think so. I think that unfortunately, and what a great loss for this country. But but Senator McCain just loved the sport of boxing and was so supportive. Um, but unfortunately, and, and you know, you could tell me more how it is in the UK, but in the US, um, back when I think he was getting closer to putting that bill forward, he just didn't have the, um, the support of the Congress to go ahead. And so it never, it, it just never went forward that much. And, and Senator Harry Reid, who I know unfortunately is very ill these days, but but because he was from Nevada, Nevada never wanted that bill. They still don't want that bill. But um, it just it just wasn't going to happen. Because of why don't they want the bill? Can you just explain that and that, like how the structure um, In the U.S., the way boxing and MMA is regulated, and that's why there should be a bill, the uh, MMA should be included in the, the – Muhammad Ali Act and the Boxing Safety Act. It should it should expand to them. I think it's terrible that it doesn't, but that's a whole other debate. But um, but but the way boxing is regulated in the U.S., it's it, each individual state controls the sport. And in other words, everyone has their own. Even though there's the Association of Boxing Commissions, there's the whole unified rules, blah blah blah. Every state controls their own piece of the pie. And so many of the smaller states, and I don't mean in size, but states that didn't have a lot of major fights were, were happy to have that kind of bill take over because it would give them more, uh, more control in trying to do the right thing. And especially if they didn't have the personnel or the budget, whatever, it would make it all under one umbrella. But more powerful states like Nevada, and that's at this you know, back then, didn't want anything like that because then they would have somebody telling them what to do. They didn't want the federal government to tell them what to do. Um, it's just like with a lot of things. You know, elections are, are in the U.S. are controlled by the individual states, to, so to speak. How they run their elections, you know, who can do absentee, who can do, you know, anyway, it's just very individualized and that's the way it remains. And so that's why it's so important for there to be a federal oversight or whatever you want to call it, if there could be a national commission, um, because then things would be done the same everywhere and there would be sharing of information, yeah. of which there's a modicum of that now. Yeah, because there's issues like patient client confidentiality, isn't there? Like mm -hmm. Yes, and you know, look, you can get around that um, in certain respects that when fighters get licensed, they get. Uh, in a national data bank 
and that information can be shared with those commissions not to go out to the public but can be shared um, just like one of the the good things that um, Obamacare has done as far as creating electronic medical records so that it goes into a one data bank so that if a patient goes to one hospital um, or has blood work in one facility it can be shared so that that it's not just this kind of unknown so that the, the medical care will be better I think it would highly benefit the fighters to have that sharing of information yeah, and I think um, it's important to also point out how much you have done to help the fighters um, and continue to do. Uh, for example, one of the things that you did was you were instrumental in establishing cost-effective MRI and MR MRA scans for fighters. And so you do have this track record. It's not just a co coincidence where you continue, continually try to help fighters. Well, you know, I mean, I think anyone, and you know this as well as I, I mean, I I think anyone that's been around uh, professional fighters, they're just amazing. You know, number one, they're extremely intelligent. They, they start doing this at a very young age. Um, the discipline is amazing. Their athleticism is amazing. And they tend to, from my experience in working with some of the, the fighters coming up with some of the biggest professional fighters that have been graced the sport when during my time, and even now when with Vada, is they just, um, they're just incredible human beings. Um, they're the best patients that I ever had. I mean, they care about their health. I think that um, that's another reason why we've created VADA and why we even did these recent little e-learning things that I don't know if you've been able to see, yeah. but I just think that, that they're, they want to they wanna do well, so they need to be able to have the advantage of information given to them on how they can better their health and safety and they as a result, have a, a longer, safer career. And so to me, I mean, how do you walk away from that when, when you've got these individuals that are so caring and really want to excel? I mean, it's, I don't, I think in my private practice, I've met many athletes of different endeavors, you know, baseball players, um, people that have been in the Olympics for ice skaters, whatever. I've, I've had exposure to other athletes, but there's something about a professional fighter that just takes so much courage and intelligence to be able to do this sport. And so to me, as a physician, how do you not want to help that individual? I mean, it should be on everyone's mind. So Varda at nine years old, is it where you want it to be? No, no. Um, obviously so many things in the sport of boxing and this goes for medical tests and medical care um, this goes along to wanting to have a federal oversight body um, fighters because they give so much to the sport need to have our support so that they can have better, longer, safer, more successful career and a successful retirement. And that unfortunately involves finances. And so many commissions, because like we just talked about states rights and, and state commissions that don't require fighters to do more than an HIV of that, um, don't have the ability to require um, appropriate testing to be done on a regular basis. You know, you were good and visited with the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health that's doing research, but a lot of fighters don't have access to be able to go to a place like that that can follow their MRIs and their medical health on a yearly basis, pro, you know, prospectively. Um, so unfortunately that takes finances and most commissions in this country, um, because we don't have a socialized medicine available um, and I'm, trust me, I'm not necessarily supportive of that, but, but we don't have that available. They can undergo the appropriate medical tests throughout their career to make sure that they're safe as they progress. So that goes along with VADA too. We don't often get the young fighters starting out. We get the high profile fighters that have more funds that are 
supported by their promoter in their career. Um, Vada itself is fighter driven. Um, obviously, there's some great promoters that have supported Vada by making sure that their fighters enter our program. But even today, it's really fighter driven. A fighter that wants to demonstrate their their um, their commitment to clean sport, and they also want to make sure that their opponent is clean because they understand the implications of fighting someone that's not. Um, so unfortunately, that takes funding and VADA doesn't have the funding itself to do that. Otherwise, I would love to have everyone enrolled. The World Boxing Council, thank goodness, has been a huge proponent of clean sport and continues to be so that fighters can volunteer to that organization and be subject to testing. Um, but, you know, even then, the, fight, the funding, no one has the amount of funding it would really take to do that on as large a scale as it needs to be internationally. Um, VADA was obviously um, becoming uh, more and more established around the time of the whole um, Olympic style WADA testing with Floyd and all the rest of it. Um, kind of like all, all things in boxing, everyone wants their piece of the pie. Um, there's more than one obviously governing or there's more than one testing agency out there with, with WADA and UCAD over here and stuff. It, lines are still blurred aren't they it's tough and it must be tough for you to be in that um in, you know as part, part of the puzzle you know i kind of keep blinders on um you know obviously in a way no one likes someone looking over their shoulder so i get it um that makes it tough often for us to go into other um other bodies that do their own testing. Um, obviously, I still believe that our testing is the most thorough. I mean, I, I know it is. And so to me, if you're going to test fighters leading up to a contest or you're going to test them year round, and this is one thing that I, I compliment the WBC for, is that they have allowed VADA to conduct the most thorough testing um, sometimes against political pressure, I'm sure, of athletes that are rated through the WBC and athletes that have volunteered because, you know, we don't have any out of competition panels. And for your listeners that don't understand that, and I've had this discussion with UCAD before, is um, according to WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, there's in-competition and out-of-competition panels of drug tests, okay? VADA, my organization, our organization, we do, we have no out-of-competition panel. In other words, fighters that join VADA or are tested through the World Boxing Council's Clean Boxing Program are subject to everything on our prohibited list. That includes stimulants and narcotics at all times, okay? Um, you know, I remember having this discussion with UCAT because, and I don't even exactly remember who it was we were on the phone with, because obviously, you know, it, uh, it does create a potential issue when you have two bodies, independent bodies, testing an athlete at the exact same time you know, why will one find one thing and another may find nothing, you know, find something else. It becomes a debatable issue, and I do get that. Um, but, um, you know, an organization like UCAD or USADA or, or any other organization in any other country that's under the WADA code, the World Anti-Doping Agency code, has to follow what they tell them. And they have two separate lists. But if you think about it, for a fighter, a professional fighter, um, how beneficial is it for a fighter, as far as safety is concerned, to train on stimulants, whether it be cocaine or amphet other amphetamines? I mean, those kinds of things aren't good during a fight. Well, if they're not good during a fight, they're not good during training. So that's why our position has been since our inception 
that athletes that are in our program should be subject to be tested for all of those entities, for stimulants at all times, for narcotics at all times. Now we removed cannabinoids, marijuana, because we still believe that those should be taken off the list. And I believe that WADA should take that off the list. But irrespective of that, that's why our prohibited list differs and we support that and continue to support that. Sure, okay. Um, people see that, um, uh, that sometimes it costs maybe $25,000 a fight to do the testing as a, as a ballpark. And people think that goes straight into doc, Dr. Margaret Goodman's bank account. No, no, at this time and, and through, our, through our program, no one on our board or officer has been paid. We don't get anything. I mean, we do this because we care and people, I've had promoters go, you gotta be kidding me. You know, you can't be, I said, of course we are. Any extra money that we have left over from what has been supported by a promotional entity we're using for education. That's why, especially during this um, downtime period for COVID, um, we actually invest e-learning projects because we wanted fighters to be able to learn more um, about supplements and getting supplements tested, um, learning what the side effects are of prohibited substance, learning more about concussion. Vlad, Vlad Klitschko has been great and participated in some of those. We have another really high profile fighter that's supposedly going to participate in another one we're working on now. So, you know, education can be kind of boring, but for a fighter, it's important for them to know and take responsibility for themselves. And I think that's why a lot of these fighters want to do and why a lot of hundreds of fighters have volunteered to the WBC program to indicate their commitment to clean sport. So, yeah, and I'll add another uh, plug for your original book, Ringside and Training Principles. There's loads of stuff in there about managing fighters and being a manager and and uh, yeah. how to be managed. So it's, it's not just a, um, a fighting handbook or training or nutrition handbook. It, it covers all aspects of the business that, that fighters really should be familiar with. Well, and I think that it's important, you know, there's all these aspects of their career, how to talk to the media appropriately, how to manage your finances from the beginning of your career, you know, things that you would think that we shouldn't be involved in, that we have no place in. To me, you know, fighters can look to somebody like a, a Ray Leonard or an Oscar De La Hoya, Floyd Mayweather, um, Lennox Lewis, um, Vladimir, and Vitaly Klitschko that are very out, high profile examples of taking care of themselves as their career went along. But fighters as they start can do those kind of things as well. And, you know, it's certainly, I think most would think that's not the place of VADA to, to discuss that, but, but I do, we wanna see everyone retire and everyone has to retire from this sport at some point but but we want to see them go on and we don't want to hear these hard luck terrible stories that sometimes we hear about for fighters that gave everything of their life to their career and then end up not doing well from a financial aspect or a physical aspect that just it just shouldn't happen and there's not those protections out there so it behooves the fighter to do these things for themselves, just like the rest of us do. Do you think sometimes um, someone or, a, well, a promoter or another um, entity has hired a, another testing agency while you've been testing a fighter so that if you were to find something in a fighter, they could then say that, well, the other testing agency hasn't found anything in a fighter? You know, I think that that's, that's a, a, an issue. I don't worry about that. I don't, I kind of keep blinders on and we just do the best job that we can do at all times. That's why we work with an organization called Claridium um, that's very worldwide and respected in the collection process that understands um, anti-doping. Um, Dr. Damsgaard that started Claridium is just brilliant and um, actually was an athlete himself for a long time 
and lives in Denmark, rides his bike to work every day. I mean, I don't even know how many miles he does. He's in incredible shape, but understands the process. And I think if we just do the best job that we can do, you know, let somebody try to argue against it. You know, the hard part is a lot of these drugs, and you know this very well, they don't have a long half-life. So if somebody tests a fighter one day, the next day that substance may not be there. So to me, if there's going to be another organization testing and the fighters have agreed to it, the more testing, the better. You know, it's we do what we can do. We also, you know, do testing for a lot less depending on what the budget is for those promotional entities uh, for that particular fight. And obviously during COVID, I'm amazed that anybody's doing drug testing yeah. and using us because it is expensive because of the level of the test that we do. The laboratory itself um, is costly. And so I, I'm, I'm amazed and, and just so pleased that fighters are still giving of themselves to undergo this kind of level of testing. Well, didn't you, didn't you get criticism at the start when you said that VADA is not going to be doing as much testing due to lockdown and, and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, everyone was faced with that, mostly because of border closures. I mean, you know this very well, being in the UK. Um, there's just those aspects, you know, we've had different states in the United States that were, you had to be quarantined if you were going to travel from Nevada to New York, you know, so we had those kind of entities because of all of our testing, if your listeners don't know, is, is um, we have to send the doping control officer to the, the place. A lot of our doping control officers were busy during COVID and still are working in hospitals. So there's those implications. And also, you know, um, we don't want the fighters and their families to ever feel that this is, this is dangerous for them, having someone from the outside come into their home or their private gym facility to test them and make them more at risk. We don't want anyone to be feeling that they're an increased risk during this time. It's such a communicable disease. Um, just going back, and this, is, this predates your, your start in boxing. I've often wondered this, you know, the, the um, 100 meter race in Seoul, which was won by Ben Johnson. And lots of those athletes fell foul of testing at some point or another in their, in their career who were in the final. During the 80s, all those big heavyweights that came and went, um, were they all being tested? Were there tests all the way through the 80s? No. I mean, there's probably not tests all through now. I mean, no, yeah, no, I, mean I, I mean, even even before COVID, what I'm saying is, yeah. um, how how an organization, and we're talking about not VADA, but let's say an, a national organization that's in charge of anti-doping for that country, or testing for the Olympics, um, or testing for um, you know, your football or for other things determines who's tested and when. There can be a lot of political impl implications on how that's carried out. And, um, you know, you can look at uh, tennis. You know, there's been lots of debates about that and who's getting tested more, why. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a, a very difficult thing to debate but it could be something that could be debated on, on why is this person getting tested more than this person? Yeah. Um, is it even handed? Um, and who's carrying out the testing and what are the expertise of the testers and what happens to the results and how um, are those results conveyed to the public? Um, are they conveyed to the public? <laughs> are they conveyed to the public? Are they conveyed to the right parties? You know, VADA, um, we do not list testing um, publicly, but one thing that was really important to me, which goes on today, is that all of our results are given to multiple parties. In other words, there's no, there's no way that something could be really pushed under the rug or not, you know, maybe not put out in the media, but not dealt with. Mm -hmm. because that was super important 
um, that that had to be the case or we wouldn't even have started VADA. In other words, that our results are given, especially if fighters are tested leading up to a fight, both sides get the results, the promoters all get the results, the commission gets the results, the ABC gets the results, box rec will get the results, um, the fighters will get the results so that nothing can be just kind of Oh, well, this will, you know, not saying this ever happened, so please don't think I'm accusatory, but just so that something that may be not determined to be an adverse result um, is somehow pushed aside. Sure. Um, so, no, that's, that's important for fairness. Because it is medical testing, um, we just have opted that we don't think it's our role to publish those results for the public. What's the best excuse you've heard for why someone's had a, posted a positive test? I'm trying to think on that one. Well, obviously people blame it on supplements, you know, um, that's number one. Um, Which is why I you would... put so much work into educating about supplements. So they, do, so they don't have that as an excuse any longer. Right, and, and that's another reason when during the downtime, um, one thing that VADA did was we joined with Banned Substance Control Group. There's another organization called NSF, and I know they're European organizations as well, and probably others internationally, that do certify supplements. And what we've offered to fighters, if you're a fighter in VADA, we will pay for you to send your supplements to get them certified to determine that they're free of performance enhancing drugs. And so that's something that's real important to us besides the actual education process, because that can be expensive too. Um, I was talking to a fighter the other day that said they spent tons of money in getting their supplements certified because they wanted to make sure that there was to a sh no shadow of a doubt that their supplements that they were using, because you just don't know what's in things and where they're manufactured and, and what they're manufactured next to that could be a performance enhancing drug that could yield an adverse result. Via contamination. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you've mentioned uh, Dr. Hermansky a couple of times. Where did you go on your first date? Um, we went, <laughs> that's funny. I think our first date was to a sushi restaurant, I think. <laughs> but really our first dates were always at fights. <laughs> I mean, he used to drag me along and then he would, you know, give me a lecture basically on what happened, what didn't happen, what should happen. And, you know, he was in a very unique position that I don't think any other ring physician has ever been that I was able to kind of tag along quietly was because of his um, exposure and working with the Nevada Commission and Mark Ratner, who was there for so many years, who was just amazing. Um, that that um, he was, ex he taught me, um, basically how important it was to make sure that everyone knew what you were doing and why during a fight. And he had exposure to the media a lot, who I always felt was important to have them understand what you were doing and not doing. Because, you know, one thing that we obviously don't have the time period to talk about, a referee or a doctor making a decision and the same thing goes with judging but especially from a referee and a physician's position of stopping a fight recommending a stoppage changes a fighter's whole life you know i mean not just from a safety aspect but you know how it is fighters coming up through the ranks if they get a fight inappropriately stopped um, or bad judging they may not be able to go on in their career. They may not be able to become the champion that they were able to become. So that becomes a huge responsibility for the ring physician and the referee and also the judges, the people officiating. But that has to be kept in your mind as well. You know, you want to do the right thing and be objective. But all those things can make a huge difference. I mean, I think you know that as well, when you, especially with fighters starting out, starting out in four rounders or six rounders or eight rounders fight. You know, they may not get picked up by a better promoter. They may not get um, their career going on as it could have been. So all of those things are super, super important. Um, 
I actually just asked you about your first date and were you going? I know, well, I, because I know, I know, here I go. But, but my point being is that we spent most of that time going to fights because, you know, we're so busy working. He was working in the emergency room. I have a busy practice and on call. And so a lot of times we go to fights. He would always come with me to those wrestling matches and sit beside me. He was the one that told me to get in when that iron sheet busted that guy's <laughs> face wide open and do something he goes why are you sitting there and i said because this is part of the show he goes no his whole face is open up so yeah those were a lot of the times we spent together in the beginning um you're on the ballot for the international boxing hall of fame not in yet are you fussed about going in uh, I, I wouldn't even think that I would be a consideration for something like that. I don't, you know, that's, I mean, that's, that would be a great honor, but you know, I think there's a lot more important people that should be considered. But like you said, you've sort of been whistleblower. You've been there for the fighters. You've done a lot. And now you've obviously carved your own path with Vada. Like, are you fussed about legacy and how you're remembered? No, because I think, I mean, I, I think, think that... I'm really old now, and I don't mean that. <laughs> I know, no, I am. I mean, my God, I need more plastic surgery. <laughs> but I think that, you know, there's different ways. I mean, there's people that, that um, obviously, I think I've created a, a significant amount of enemies, you know, maybe even an anti-doping. But um, I think that, uh, I just hope that, I think that organizations like the ARP for physicians is fantastic. I think that one thing that I've seen that happens more and more is ring physicians, potential ring physicians are learning that they have to do more than just work a fight. You know, even though that's a gigantic responsibility that changes your whole life. And I hope that um, one thing that I think especially Dr. Homansky more than me has contributed to that I hope will be carried on even more is for physicians to take more of a responsibility of that it's not just working a fight, that it's these fighters' careers and, and what kind of testing they need, what kind of follow-up they need. Um, what we need to do to protect them in the whole, not just during the confines of the weigh-in and the fight and how we triage them, that there's a lot more to the job than that. And I think if anything, I feel as a contributor to that, and I hope that's one thing that I will be remembered for. As far as VADA, um, I hope that, that as time goes on, um, not so much more and more testing comes on uh, comes about, but that the fighters themselves, um, that I could hopefully be remembered as somebody that's that's helped to give fighters the know-how that they can take responsibility for their own career, that they don't need to rely on just their coach or their trainer um, or their promoter, that they need to do this for themselves. And that to me is the most important thing because sometimes you just don't know that. And especially young fighters coming along in the sport that start at such a young age, they, they think of their coach as their you know, second father or mother. And they don't, they, they don't take the, that responsibility or know that that's something that they can make those decisions for themselves. And so I just hope that that's it. If anything, I hope that that's something that I've helped to promote. Sure. Well, in 2005, you were given the uh, James Farley Award from the BWAA and for, for honesty, integrity, and, and we're 15 years on from there. So you've done a fair bit of work. Since. <laughs> I don't know if they'd give it to me again, but no, that was really kind. Um, I do have some final questions from the guys who um, support the podcast on Patreon, if I may. Okay. Um, Paul asks, uh, in Margaret's opinion, what are the long-term differences in neurological issues between MMA fighters and boxers, if any? So I'm, I suppose we're talking chronic. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I will tell you, um, just like I thought commissions need to say when they were wrong, I think that initially in MMA, um, obviously it's very easy to sit back and say, because there's so many other ways to win a fight that MMA fighters would not suffer the, um, as large a degree of chronic injuries as a boxer, but I don't think that's true. I believe that as the sport has become more and more prominent um, and more and more athletic, 
athletes or to the sport other than just college wrestlers, uh, people with um, at an older age that that fighters are starting in MMA at a younger age, that I think that they are predisposed to pretty much the same things as a boxer. I know there's been some studies that may look at that and say, well, maybe not quite as much, but I think it's much greater than I initially anticipated. Okay. Um, In other words, I'm trying to say it's probably very close together. Sure. Okay. Uh, Isol Cody says, firstly, I'm looking at a copy of Death in Vegas on my shelf. Uh, secondly, looking comparatively at how sports such as rugby have ever evolving evidence-based concussion policies, how would she think boxing with its fractious nature being able to ensure consistency in reducing training and participation in the wake of TBIs, similar, similar to graduated return to play. Um, so, yeah, I guess re return to play and, and I suppose we're looking at singing off the same, same hymn sheet. And it's difficult, isn't it? Because when you're looking at consistency and reducing training and participation, how do you supervise everyone? It's horrible. I mean, it's just a, a, an ongoing problem. The one good thing that, um, that the person that wrote into you that boxing does have is an MMA is, and if it's done um, through a commission, okay, so it's regulated, there are automatic suspensions. In other words, um, especially in boxing, it's easy to refer to. There's a certain number of days or weeks or months that are given to an athlete depending on just the number of rounds they compete in, not necessarily whether they suffered a tough fight or a TKO or a KO, but also the number of rounds. Most sports don't have those kind of automatic suspensions. The problem becomes, just like you said a minute ago, is enforcing that. And it would be nice if the gyms were regulated um, somewhat so that that could be better enforced. Um, I think, you know, we talked about earlier the uniformity among commissions, and then there's a uniformity among physicians who determine the triaging of a fighter. You know, some ring physicians may watch a fight and may not think that somebody needs 90 days before they compete again. Um, someone else may think that person needs more time, and they may not necessarily recommend post-fight testing before they get back in the ring again. So. There's all those kind of differentiation, and that's why if there was, at least in the U.S., if there was some kind of federal oversight, those things could be better regulated for the protection of the fighters. And this is also something, it's something we definitely talked about before, you and I, but something I've just written about for Boxing Scene, is it's, it's also important to remember that the guys who win a fight also need to get checked out too, because I've actually just written a column about this um, Dillian white Povetkin rematch, and everyone's talking about Dillian White, is he okay after that big knockout coming back um, to fight again at the on November 21st? But Povetkin was down twice and White was winning the fight. So what about Povetkin? So it's easy to look at the loser and think he needs the attention, but so you can't take her off the ball with the guys that win either. A hundred percent. I mean, I've, I've talked about that a lot. I mean, that's super important. I think another interesting thing and I don't know how it's been studied, I, mean, I think I asked the Luruvo Center, is uh, women fighters. And um, I think that, um, and I, I think that at least when I was working fights, and I think it's gotten a lot better subsequently, is that too often, because people perceived that um, the women fighters weren't doling out quite as much punishment that they may not, they may have been uh, um, not disregarded, but not given enough credibility to the punishment that they were taking during a bout and recommend the lengthier suspensions and further evaluation. I think now, I think that, you know, there's such amazing huge group now of women boxers, which when I was working there, there wasn't, there was a lot of mismatches, that there's just such incredible, talented, strong women that are competing in the sport of boxing, that I think it's probably given more credibility to understanding the punishment that they're taking. Because I used to see that um, suspensions years ago 
weren't get as lengthy to the women fighters, even though they fought as tough a fight. So I think that that was a huge difference, but um, I think it's gotten a lot better. Um, Martin Blackburn asks, any tales of near misses with fighters who thankfully didn't ignore warning signs? What do you mean? What so do you think you mean? I'm guessing um, fighters who, near misses, fighters who thankfully didn't ignore warning So basically guys that hung them, up, hung, hung them up at the right time and, and refused refused the lure of the ring to, to come back, I guess. Do you know any, anyone that was thinking about coming back but, but thought better of it? Um, yes. Yes, I would think that, and it shouldn't be me saying that, but I think if you talk to a fighter like Andre Ward, who's such a brilliant fighter and a champion, I bet you there's tons of people that would love to see him back in the ring. And I think that he has been just brilliant in evolving his career into other entities. Um, the contrary to that is sometimes you, you worry about these fighters coming back when they've been out of the ring for so many years, you worry about that as well. So, yeah. Um, this is a bit of a rabbit hole here from Brenda Connolly. So see, see, see what you feel about this. Gloves are a key component regarding protection against not only cosmetic damage, but longer term brain damage. Do you think more research and development should be carried out into the design of the glove? I personally think there should be, and also a more standardized choice of gloves should be used. I mean, no, I, I agree. Yeah, that's that's about the punches, gloves, and rares, and all the different things. I mean, should there be a standard uniform? I think so. I think the problem is that it's you know a free enterprise, especially in the U.S., and also that there just aren't enough studies to make those determinations. Um, you know, people talk about bare knuckle boxing, so to speak, which isn't really completely bare knuckle. Um, that was another thing. Thing that talking about MMA and head injuries is that a lot of people believe that because MMA fighters wear those gloves that are mostly just protecting the hand and the knuckles, not those bigger gloves, that that's another reason why there's not as many head injuries because if they did hit that hard all the time, they would break their hand. Yeah. So um, the gloves essentially are protecting the hands, um, the bigger gloves um, can they dull more punishment? I think, you know, you have to debate whether or not uh, lighter, smaller gloves give more punishment to the brain versus not, you know, cosmetically or just looking. It looks like, you know, bigger gloves like with Tough Man that we have in the U.S., which obviously is a, a bad issue, but Tough Man that they can't hurt each other because they have these big, huge pillow gloves, but that's just not true. Um, but yeah, once again, with everything, there needs to be standardization. Um, last one here. This is from Glenn Wilson. And it's probably the one that people have been listening to this podcast waiting to, to hear the answer. The burning question for me is whether VADA should have greater authority to impose sentences on drug cheats. When you <sighs> one boxer receiving a two-year ban for accidentally ingesting an OTC project over the counter product that's not clearly labelled, labeled, while another receives a six-month ban for having a concoction of illegally acquired PEDs. One organization like VADA can bring some consistency to the table, as well as appropriate punishment based on scientific evidence and not on financial motives. I mean, it makes perfect sense to me, but I can see you exploding. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the reason, I mean, look, there's a bunch of reasons why not. Number one, our, our aim was not to take over the sport. Two, we still do have respect for commissions to make those determinations. As somebody that worked with a commission for so long, I still think they should be the ones to make those determinations. Unfortunately, as we've talked about at nauseum, probably for a lot of people, that it would be nice if there was one entity kind of overseeing the sport so that things were uniform as far as suspensions for various items. But then again, if you look at um, the court of arbitration of sport, everyone deserves the right to argue their results. Um, I think with commissions, it's the same thing. From a legal position, God, that would just open such a huge thing for, for VADA in having to deal with the legality 
of those determinations and arguments that would need to be presented to make some kind of uniform suspension for certain things. But that's, that's why it's kind of, you know, it looks like it's a nice hands off way for us to get out of it. I just think that it should be handled by athletic commissions. And unfortunately, that's the best thing to do. I think it's unfortunate there's no uniformity. I agree. Realist, realistically, you'd be spending 52 weeks a year in court, wouldn't you, if you did that? Yeah. And who wants to do that? Um, one thing that was mentioned. So a guy, a, a fighter I interviewed last week, actually, he failed a, he passed a positive test when he was fighting in the early 2000s for recreational drugs. And he said recreational dr drugs, you know, maybe a, 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 a year ban, for example, because you're not actually trying to hurt someone. If, if anything, you're hindering your own performance. Um, but for PEDs and more sinister stuff, um, you know, you're actually actively trying to cheat. Do you think there's any merit to that kind of argument? Um. Just yes that. and no. It's a complicated. Well, yes and no because it's a complicated issue. Um, number one, someone that's on um, a drug like cocaine, um, which obviously is an easy one to think about as far as a stimulant. Um, what kind of punishment are they able to give somebody on that drug? Um, and also what are the risks to the athlete themselves that's taking that drug? Um, I think that there should be gradations of punishments um, depending on what the athlete's able to demonstrate on how they took something, why they took something, or what, you know, it would prove, able to prove that it was a contaminant that wasn't listed. Um, you know, there's that uh, aspect that everybody's responsible for anything that they put in their system. So, I mean, I think it's a loaded question and yes, there should be gradations on punishment, but I do think that um, as I kind of tried to allude to earlier that stimulants and narcotics can be just as bad um, during a fight and during training to the fighter and their opponent as other more traditionally thought of performance enhancing drugs like anabolic steroids. Okay. Well, we'll leave it there, but I'm so grateful that you've given up some of your weekend to spend some time uh, talking. This is something we've, we've talked about doing for a little while and, and I'm really grateful for your time as always. No, thank you. I have the utmost respect for you. I, I think what you're doing is incredible. I think the sport is very lucky to have you. Um, it's not always easy. I can tell you, I do understand from a, um, I hate to use the word political because that just puts it in too much of a one category, but from, from the aspect of having to speak honestly as a journalist, I know how hard it is. And I think it's just great that you're around and I can't wait to see more and I'm, I'm just keep doing what you're doing. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time and uh, I'll let you get back to the horses. Okay. You be safe. Take care. All the best. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.